sponsored by Hamas Company and Foley and Lardner. Mm -hmm. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Roger Strode of Foley and Lardner. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Roger Strode. I'm a partner uh, with Foley and Lardner in its Chicago office, and I'm a member of the uh, National Healthcare Practice here at Foley and Lardner. Um, we wanted to thank everybody for taking time out today um, to, to sit and listen to us, and, and hopefully you're going to learn a few things about executing an ambulatory strategy. Um, our friends at uh, Hamas Company have been very kind um, to sponsor this conference and have asked us to participate uh, a little bit uh, in today's call. The program is going to run for one hour, and we are going to apply for one general CLE credit for today's program. So uh, any lawyers on the line, um, especially if you, you are in New York, New Jersey, and Kansas and are applying for CLE credit, you have to fill out your attorney affirmation form and write down a course code that is going to be announced at some point during the webcast. Um, and you can get that attorney affirmation form and the slides uh, can be obtained in the materials section on your screen. Questions can be submitted during the web conference by entering in them in the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll answer questions at the end as time permits. So uh, at some point during the conference, I'll give you that, uh, that all-important code. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to Mark Coughlin, who's Senior Vice President I'm a, as, as Roger mentioned, I'm the Senior Vice President with Hammoth Company. I lead our consulting practice nationally uh, and am joined today with, with two of our leaders of our, of our consulting practice. Uh, Hammoth Company is, is, is very deeply involved in the development of ambulatory strategies and execution of ambulatory strategies nationally. Uh, and personally, I've been involved in this for, for over 25 years. Becky, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Becky Flink. I'm the practice leader for uh, the operations uh, component of the consulting area. Uh, I have um, a very diverse background, uh, spent um, many years, uh, 20 plus years in hospital and clinic operations, and had the opportunity the last 18 plus years prior to joining Hamas to be a VP of facilities development where I was instrumental in working uh, to build uh, six new uh, greenfield hospitals, as well as over about 75 plus new clinics and many more that we uh, renovated. And this is Ted Carson. I'm the National Director of Real Estate Advisory Services for Hamas Company. And we are working with health systems on their ambulatory initiatives, and so we're happy and excited to share with you our observations on how successful health systems have rolled out their ambulatory expansion programs. So our discussion today, what we really want to do is, is spend um, a few minutes just talking about the impact that, that health care reform and changing care, care patterns are having on and driving really the development of, of ambulatory strategies. Uh, don't want to spend a lot of time because I think everybody on the phone is, is familiar with that, but just to set the stage. We then want to talk about the, the M&A trends that we're seeing nationally that are driving a lot of this ambulatory development, the physician practices of the future, some of the different real estate implications and strategies, and then walk through a case study. Um, as we go through um, this, um, as Roger mentioned, um, please uh, submit any questions that you have and we'll answer them at the end as time permits. Additionally, as we as we go through this, we we really scheduled this and structured this so that it would last, you know, um, approximately 50 to 55 minutes, so that it will leave us, you know, five to 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. So the obviously, uh, it, as we're looking at this nationally, we're starting to see the development of of a large number of ambulatory networks across the country, and it's really being driven a lot by. Um, the structural changes that are occurring out of healthcare reform. I think as you look at uh, where an ambulatory network fits within the component, the overall component uh, of an organization's uh, reform strategy, is that it really does create those access points that healthcare providers are going to need to be to be relevant in a narrow network contracting environment to be able to connect with their patients. 
It also provides lower cost sites of care that, are, that will allow healthcare institutions um, to be successful in a more constrained reimbursement environment. Um, and it finally, it does create the opportunity um, to, um, to diversify and, and, and expand the geographies in which we, ser in which we operate. Um, the, in, in, as we patient volumes across the country that are projected to even accelerate into the future, as well as changing care patterns as, as volume moves from an outpatient setting into an, from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. That, that growth opportunities that exist um, for organizations is really diversifying away from their acute care, and that whether that's the primary care, the specialty care, or even the diagnostic and treatment, and all the way into wellness, it's that that's the growth opportunity for our for our par providers. Um, and they really do give us the opportunity to, uh, for success in the future. As I mentioned before, it gives us the opportunity to create those access points, but it also allows us to integrate across the continuum and to align with our physician partners, align. Um, our ambulatory services in, in, a, in a more cohesive fashion and not really the fragmented care delivery model that exists in the past. Um, it, and, and as I mentioned before, it does, it does create those access points in the lower cost sites of care. So as you develop your ambulatory plan and you've developed your vision for the future of your ambulatory network, the question is, how do you then move into and execute on that overall strategy? Um, and as we as we look at that, it's really it's it's a defining those priority ge geographies, identifying our our population management targets, defining the physician strategy and the ancillary services, uh, and then and moving away from the old hub and spoke model of care, where where all of the referrals were were intended to centralize back to the hospital, and really look at how do we create that constellation model where we've do, where we've do, located our services as close to the population. Uh, as we as is operationally efficient. So once that's all been defined, once that strategy has been defined and moving forward, there are a number of key elements that are critical to executing on that ambulatory strategy. The first of which is is an organizational structure. As, as we move away from of a more institutional organizational structure into more nimble structure, how, do, how what does that organizational structure look like? We also want to create the best practice care environment. That we can that we can replicate in multiple settings across multiple sites, so that we're not recreating the wheel every time. We want to have we want to talk about physician onboarding. How do we integrate and align those physicians um, into that common operating Thanks, Mark. Uh, this is Roger Strub from Foley and Lardner. One of the things that um, uh, the folks at Hamas and, and we talked about is how uh, hospital acquisitions, mergers, affiliations, how they're affecting ambulatory strategies and how they're really driving ambulatory strategies and really kind of what's going on out there right now. And, and, and what I wanted to do was kind of give you our perspective on, on what's going on first in in hospital affiliations, mergers, joint ventures, whatever it might be, kind of how long we think the horizon on this is, why, why folks are doing what they're doing, and how it really affects and is driven by ambulatory strategies. Um, you know, the, kind of the best information that we have and what we believe is that, that this sort of record pace, um, we haven't seen a pace of merger and acquisition activity in, uh, among hospitals and health systems like this in, in decades. And um, we kind of think that we'll, we'll probably continue to see this kind of pace for at least another three to five years. I mean, if you listen to the investment bankers out there and the, and you know the folks in the know, that they think that it's probably a three to five year horizon on most of this. And and really, um, if you look at some of the transactions that are going on, it's very interesting to see the different types of transactions. We just put a few. I just put a few of them up here. Uh, the Trinity Health CHE affiliation, which which at this point creates, uh, I believe, the largest Catholic healthcare system in the country. Um, CHI's over $2 billion acquisition of St. Luke's Episcopal, 
tenant and vanguard in the in the for profit area. Uh, you've got in markets like Scottsdale and, and suburban Chicago and suburban Cleveland, uh, mid-sized healthcare systems forming larger healthcare systems and large healthcare systems acquiring smaller healthcare systems. Some of the other things that you're seeing is you're seeing things like um, uh, Southern Illinois Healthcare, for example, just uh, joined uh, a BJC collaborative, which they refer to as a, a sort of a coalition of Midwestern hospital systems with the goals, and their, their quote was the goal of quality and different fashions in a lot of different ways. And, and really, what what are the reasons that they're doing it? Um, I, I think there 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 are probably three big reasons. And I think the first one is is many of these systems, many of these hospitals, they feel the need to be large enough to be relevant to both payers and most importantly to physicians. And I think payers and physicians, most importantly, because they need the geographic. In many cases, they need the geographic reach in order to become large enough to put ambulatory sites in different locations and then have both inpatient as well as outpatient centers in various regions. The same thing goes with being, becoming relevant to physicians because I think the, the feeling is, is that many large hospitals, that um, some of them have very good strategies around the employment and the alignment of physicians and others just don't and just kind of haven't gotten there yet. And the reason that you'll see and you'll see hospital systems come together is because one system may have a very good physician strategy while another doesn't, but yet has the geographic reach that the other needs. So that, that perfect melding of, of, of joint venture arrangements between hospitals. The other is, is a lack of access to capital and mostly what we see for IT build out, physician alignment, and ambulatory strategies. Um, again, smaller hospitals have found themselves locked out of the capital markets. Either they're completely, they're completely borrowed up, they can't really refinance, or they can't refinance their debt at attractive rates. They're finding themselves with capital, either cash on hand that's declining because their margins are either flat or negative. Um, so they're looking for partners that can help them with things like IT build out, which is going to be necessary under the ACA because you need IT, because you need quality data, because you're going to need that quality data in order to participate in ACOs, to participate in any other shared savings arrangements, et cetera. And many of these hospitals just don't have it. The other thing is, is with physicians um, uh, uh, and then entering the ACO strategies with physicians. And I think finally the, the, the last thing we see around these types of just pure play um, acquisition arrangements or pure play mergers is a concern among many hospitals that at some point the music's going to stop in the, in, the music, in the game of musical chairs. And when it does stop in a market, especially smaller or mid-sized hospitals that are, say, standalone community hospitals, they don't want to be the last one standing. Um, and and, and uh, that is one of the reasons why we see you know, many of these mid-sized and community hospitals sort of running for cover. Um, something else, uh, another thing that some very good business drivers are these for-profit and not-for-profit partnerships that we're seeing. Um, you know, a, a, good, a good example is Duke LifePoint, which is the um, Duke Hospitals and, and LifePoint, um, the for-profit LifePoint partnership that uh, is, you know, has been fairly successful in, in finding partners around. Um, for example, uh, Duke and LifePoint recently signed a deal with Russell. in joint venture um, and acquire and or joint venture with community hospitals. So the Duke LifePoint, the Cleveland Clinic Community Hospital System deals are, are primarily around hospitals. 
Um, another area where you see around ambulatory strategies are deals between, for example, USPI, United Surgical Partners in Baylor. They've created a company called THVG, which um, has been fairly successful down in, in Baylor service area down in Texas in acquiring interests in ambulatory surgery centers and joint venturing with doctors, as well as um, uh, physician-owned hospitals. And the drivers for these that we see are these academic affiliations bring this increased clinical expertise and enhanced reputational value to, uh, to the for-profit uh, uh, partners. And what do the for-profit partners bring? Well, the for-profit partners are in a better position to provide capital. And frankly, they also provide a geographic outreach that, say, the Cleveland Clinic and or Duke um, and or Baylor might not be able to get in other markets. Um, so, you know, we see, we see a lot of that. And then finally, what you see is you see the expertise of the Duke Life, of the, of the Life Points, the Community Health System, the USPI, in running the ambulatory strategies for many of these places. For example, United Surgical Partners, uh, as part of their THVG partnership, my understanding is, is that they have um, extremely handy to Baylor because the USPI people probably do ambulatory strategy uh, in terms of ambulatory surgery as good as anybody. Um, so that's really what, what we're seeing around M&A um, activity and how that sort of is being driven by these ambulatory strategies. Thank you, Roger. Uh, as part of that, obviously the physician practice uh, is going to change in the future also. These new system changes are affecting how ph physicians align and so forth. The physician practice model probably is uh, experiencing the biggest or greatest changes in the marketplace right now. Um, rising cost, um, there's shrinking reimbursement, uh, those new alignments, the um, there are uh, shortages in different types of specialties that have been uh, in comparison to the past, and also uh, a lot more paperwork, increased regulatory and compliance requirements. Uh, there will be multiple types of structures that will be utilized to support that medical practice also. As Roger indicated, there's uh, different kinds of alignments. Uh, some of them are profits and not-for-profits. Um, uh, groups joining uh, hospital systems, so forth. So how that structure affects how the physician will practice uh, could be different. You'll see group practice governance where the practice itself um, sets up its own uh, guidelines and so forth. There'll be uh, groups that will actually align directly with uh, hospital-operated structures. Um, there will be those few independent models depending upon what part of the country you're in uh, will determine how long that is or, or does last. Um, for some, it could be a long-term issue. For others, uh, in different parts of the country, it's already changed a lot. Uh, management contracts are out there. Um, there's also... Um, contracted service relationships, and then obviously the academic models. Uh, thanks, Becky. This is Roger Stroud again. Um, what, a, a few of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about today was kind of how physician alignment strategies, especially as they apply to you know, ambulatory strategies, um, what they look like, uh, what's out there, uh, briefly what some of the legal issues around them are. And, and clearly, an for, for my hospital clients and my physician clients, ambulatory strategies, uh, a hospital standing alone or a health system standing alone without physicians to align with, with respect to their ambulatory strategies, uh, it just really is, is awfully meaningless. They're just, they're, you know, you need the doctors and you need alignment with physicians um, in order to execute um, an ambulatory strategy and have any success at all in an ambulatory strategy. And some hospital systems have been brilliant at it. 
and um, and other hospital systems haven't been as successful, unfortunately. And and that's when I, I believe that you've seen hospitals that have failed or are failing is because one of the one of the reasons is is their alignment strategy just isn't what it ought to be, and their ambulatory strategy just isn't what it ought to be. talk about is, um, for example, if you're, uh, when you're talking about employed physician models where you've got a more direct alignment with a, with a doctor, that is, you either employ them directly or you employ them indirectly or you synthetically employ them, they're going to be driven by legal and, and, and local dynamics. For example, if you're in a corporate practice state that has very strong corporate practice model, whether it be Texas or California or Massachusetts, for example, likely the physicians are going to find themselves in foundation type models um, where you're in a non-corporate practice state uh, or, or at least in a corporate practice state where the corporate practice of medicine isn't quite as strong um, and or it's, it's more driven by local custom. Um, for example, the state of Wisconsin is a, is, is a perfect example uh, of a state where the direct employment by physicians, by hospitals or hospital systems uh, it's acceptable, uh, and it's not only acceptable, it's, it's widely practiced within the state of Wisconsin, as an example. Um, if you're in markets where there's sort of a strong independence among the physicians, we see more what we call professional services arrangements, PSAs. We also sort of refer to them as synthetic employment. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, and or we see yeah, management services type of arrangements. We're seeing less of the MSAs or MSOs and more of the PSA type of arrangements as physicians around physician employment trends or physician acquisition trends uh, to start with. In terms of physician acquisition trends, um, we, we're seeing less acquisition of physician practices. And frankly, I believe we're seeing less of that because there are now less physician practices to acquire. Um, the heyday of the acquisition of physician practices, probably the halcyon days uh, for those that were involved in physician practice acquisition, uh, you really began to slow down about 18 months or two, two years ago. Uh, anywhere. Um, but, but you are still seeing physician You see very few markets. Uh, the, I mean, the, the markets, I believe, are sort of few and far between where you see very large or you see very large numbers of independent physicians. Around uh, the Palm Beach, the Jupiter area, you're still seeing a lot of physicians that are in small independent groups and are just beginning to align with, that, with hospitals. But I think part of this is it's because of payer mixes, and it's very it's very location specific. But you look at places like Wisconsin, where you don't see an awful lot of independent physicians anymore. They're either part of very large groups, or they're part of large groups that are affiliated with hospitals. But when we do see these trends in terms of the acquisition trends, um, we don't see unless the, for example, um, one of the things people always ask us about is how much can you pay for a physician practice. Um, you know, we're, we're still seeing some valuations when physician practices have ancillaries. You're seeing valuations based upon cash flow streams. But when physician practices are pure play, we're seeing an awful lot of doctors on uh, production-based formulas. It's only the rare physician that, that tends to be on a, uh, on a static formula or on a fixed, fixed kind of base salary, and that's generally out of training or it's maybe a one-year guarantee to get them used to some sort of a production-based formula. But what we're also seeing from a legal standpoint is we're seeing an awful lot, uh, we're seeing increased activity. Iowa 
Um, the most recent example, maybe the, 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 an example that, that probably is um, the, the most germane to most, uh, at least healthcare lawyers, is the Toomey Hospital case in Sumter, um, South Carolina, where a jury verdict uh, concluded is yet to be seen, but um, the penalties that Toomey Hospital could pay a lot of times is what we call synthetic employment or PSA arrangements. And what those really are is when a physician practice essentially sells its heart corporation or professional association, um, the to a generally anywhere from a three to we see three to seven year arrangement with the physician group to provide all the physician services that the physicians can provide and that the hospital needs for its patients. These types of arrangements are, are increasingly popular for a couple of reasons. One of them is that, that you, can meet rel you can meet necessary Stark Law, and anti Stark Law exceptions and anti-kickback. Um, uh, if not safe harbors, you can make them compliant with the anti-kickback statute. It allows the physicians to stay in their own practice. It's structured correctly. Um, the, the, you're, what you're not doing that you have to do in, a, in an employment model And the doctors, and this is important because it's an administrative burden, and and it allows it takes away an administrative burden, it takes away a legal burden, so long as the payment between the group and the hospital is fair market value, the group is then fairly free to compensate their physicians. The other thing that it allows the hospitals to do in many cases is they can take those physician practice sites and convert those to provider-based facilities. And some hospitals still find provider-based billing as an ambulatory strategy to be, to be very advantageous. Only two payments being made, one for the physician service and one for the facility service. The problem, that one of the cons is while while it's increased reimbursement overall, decreased it is decreased reimbursement on the physician side often. And then there's then, then there's the naughty problem of having uh, double copays to patients and patients becoming upset because of balance billing around copays, etc. But but m many times. play we see, um, I'm less of a fan of it, are ancillary carve-out transactions as part of an ambulatory strategy where hospitals will buy the, uh, the ancillaries of a physician group, say a PT practice out of a physician group or an, uh, a radi uh, an, imaging, an imaging business out of a physician group or a lab out of a physician group. Uh, one of the concerns that we always have with these transactions is that, that broadly under the Stark and the fraud and abuse laws, you can't pay someone based upon the volume or value of their referrals. And in many cases, these ancillary carve-out deals, um, the, the ancillaries that are being paid for are generally used only by one group, and that one group will stay out in the community. And presumably, uh, a hospital or a healthcare provider would only buy those ancillaries if, in fact, the group was going to continue to utilize those ancillaries. So, to me, it raises it raises some serious stark and front abuse questions that have to be looked at carefully. Um, kind of to, to to sort of to wrap this up a little bit um, and and talk about um, what finally you know from a legal standpoint the kind of the, the I would say three big things we're seeing around ambulatory strategies and physicians. 
really, from a compliance standpoint, they break down into kind of three big buckets. Um, we are, we are, we at Foley and Lardner advise our clients, and I know that that most really good. The contracts are in writing, signed by the parties, don't take into consideration the volume or value of referrals, and that all agreements meet some sort of a core exception under the Stark Law and comply or substantially comply with, the, with, the, with some sort of a from the anti-kickback statute. The second thing is, is that we tend to advise our clients that they should strongly consider obtaining third-party support for physician comp arrangements, especially million dollars. Um, and, and, and we also think that, that coupled with that is that the compensation relationships really should be periodically reviewed kind of on an ongoing basis to make sure that overall compensation to your physicians in the ambulatory arrangements that hospitals adopt some sort of a reasonable compensation cap um, around the compensation structure, because that usually then fits both with not only the Stark Law, the anti-kickback statute, but as well as um, IRS guidance. So anyway, to, to kind of wrap it up, that's, that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the physician issues around ambulatory strategies. the practice models that uh, is going to be used going forward. Uh, part of that is looking at present state and determine uh, practice benchmarks that uh, need to be utilized or want that's practicing, but by the staff that's working within that practice itself. Along with that, uh, we'll talk a bit later about prototyping, which is basically replicating uh, um, the workflow over and over. Uh, what is the timeline to bring that practice on? And I'll talk about that in a, the next slide. And then determine and execute any changes within the practice, uh, certainly looking at cost control measures, methods of registration, will that change, will it not, uh, supply uh, issues, and uh, system support, depending upon is a word that's been coming out in, and used by many others, so it's nothing uh, new. Uh, called physician onboarding. And basically, it provides a collection of tools and a set of skills to maximize the transition or to help integrate a individual practice, a group practice, or a multi-site practice uh, into its new affiliation model. In order to maximize the process, you have to take a look first at um, the ambulatory strategy. One that's been um, developed um, will help set up expectations uh, and also uh, align uh, the physician practices where they're needed. Uh, the physician practice model, as I indicated, may change, may not change. It's important to remember that the operational elements uh, may change even if they stay in the same site that they're in. The second piece to that is analyzing where that physician practice needs to be. As part of the ambulatory strategy, um, different uh, specialists will be needed at different sites and different locations potentially. Uh, that all is part of the, uh, the change process that will occur with the individual physician. In order to uh, look at the next element, you look at transition. Um, many times, uh, folks are brought on board, and although the physician has been involved in the negotiations and or 
the group practice have, has been in, involved in the negotiations. Not, not everything has been laid out, and this is a good time to talk about making sure that there is a link between compensation and the productivity, and lay those expectations out early. system. Credentialing has not been a norm within that system. Again, as Roger indicated, more and more often uh, we're talking about larger mergers, uh, but credentialing is still a part of it. It's important to uh, create a central team that will manage that, as well as create and establish a strong uh, collection process immediately. Uh, if if uh, physicians continue to see patients, and uh, they have not been credentialed, obviously those collections are lost. So it's important to make sure that that team is up and ready to go as these new uh, groups are started. Uh, I use the word teach um, in order to spend the time early to educate both the physician and the support team, their RNs or uh, MAs, et cetera, on the EMR system. Um, they may be using the present EMR system uh, of the new affiliation, uh, but many times they're not, and so oftentimes it, it takes more than just a few meetings to make that happen. That should be part of the plan from the very beginning in order to maximize um, the relationship. Probably the most important one is, is the word onboard. It's a set of uh, what we call concierge services and um, many times are often forgotten um, when you think about frames and set up those milestones so that the, the new uh, team feels part of the new system, whether it's small or large. Uh, simple things as human resource orientation, making sure that happens day one versus a month later, uh, making sure the IT assessment is done on a timely is optimized, um, looking at the redesign of the office workflow so that it fits into the new organization and, and works well. Um, Marketing, making sure that there's a marketing plan and that the physician uh, who's coming on board or the group that's coming on board is, is participating in, in that particular plan in order to make sure that the integration feels uh, uh, good and works out well. And then uh, obviously looking at uh, integrating the supply chain and all of the elements that are uh, going to change for that particular practice early on. Um, finally, you need to monitor. Um, you, you have to be ready to go day one, the day that that practice changes, but you also need to monitor and do ongoing monitor to make sure that everything uh, has been done and continues to work as, as planned, as well as monitor the um, expectations of the new physician practice. So, I've worked a little bit with physician onboarding and we've learned some lessons. Um, wanted to just bring those up today. First of all, in order to do it effectively, uh, you have to have on-site day-to-day support. Two to three week period. Strong coordination with your IT team whoever that is and whatever that looks like within the new system. You need to have um, improved communication, especially to the staff. Uh, again, it's as big of a change for them as it is for the individual uh, who's changing practice scenarios. Um, it will help support then a higher level of satisfaction. It will definitely increase the compliance uh, components and it, it usually, if not always, uh, improves production through the uh, office practice. So operational prototyping. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit in a uh, 
uh, to make sure that the new benchmarks are, are, are there. It helps develop the flexibility and provide some options. It definitely um, increases patient satisfaction. Again, there's another whole group out there that often are missed as we talk about the changes in our uh, practice models. Uh, definitely that patient is one of them. etc. Uh, also you need to recognize the uh, need for effective communication among your staff members. Again, uh, many times these changes occur and they haven't been brought along depending upon how large that group is. Um, and finally, acknowledge always the role of IT in the care model uh, because that definitely changes how things flow and, and work within the system. The next piece is to talk a, a little bit about uh, branding. Uh, again, I'm bringing this in a little earlier, but I think um, Ted will talk a little bit about it as we go. Prototyping uh, provides scalable spaces, and we'll be going through that in our, uh, our story later. Uh, common building images, colors are coordinated, consistent signage. You can read uh, the different elements there but it, it definitely maximizes patient expectations. Okay. Thanks, Becky. Uh, again, this is Ted Carson, and I'm going to be brief uh, in the interest of time because, as Becky mentioned, we have a, a, a but from a, from a real estate perspective, uh, some of the items that uh, we want you to be mindful of as you're embarking on your ambulatory expansion program is the process used to evaluate uh, sites. Again, Becky mentioned prototyping. We think there's uh, some significant advantages to adopting that practice. Uh, talk well, just briefly about the different types of trans calculate your cost of occupancy. One thing that we speak with our health system clients very frequently about is the need to adopt a retail mindset in site selection for their ambulatory facilities. Um, as as uh, the ambulatory wave uh, uh, goes through the industry, um, one thing that's going to be of, of, of great importance is convenience and access. And we, we recommend that you do a peer group comparison to make sure that any of the sites that you're considering are at a minimum par to where your competition is because, again, convenience is going to be a, a variable that uh, is used in selecting healthcare in the future, so you want to make sure that relative to your competition vis-a-vis -vis, you have uh, uh, adequate sites. Adaptive reuse is the, is the idea of, over, you know, of uh, taking uh, an existing facility market that's not always uh, feasible. So uh, please don't forget that there's, uh, uh, there's the possibility to uh, repurpose existing structures for your needs. Again, uh, going back to prototyping, uh, I think the, 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 the greatest value of prototyping is through the operational benefits, but there are quite a few just quantifiable upfront value or uh, benefits, cost benefits that can be achieved just from the facility perspective. Uh, as you can see, you can uh, significantly reduce some of your uh, design and uh, construction related costs. Um, have a greater degree of certainty on your costs and, and your timing. And then again, you'll be able to deliver a more consistent brand image and uh, a brand standard. In model, uh, they can be quite significant uh, depending on the number of facilities that you're going to uh, implement. Uh, the, the, the top uh, 
uh, and you can't necessarily put a, a value on that from a dollar perspective, but uh, the ability to get a consistent uh, and agreed upon operational and facility model up front and then not have to have repeat recurrent user group uh, meetings uh, is, is, is invaluable in the, in the minds of many of our clients. Transaction structure. Uh, historically, many health systems have just had a, a philosophical mentality that uh, owning uh, their real estate was the appropriate approach. And, and that, that still may be the case in many instances, but we encourage our clients to consider leasing as, a, as, a, as an alternative model. Uh, lower upfront capital investments, and, and quite frankly, depending on the market and the maturity level of the market from a real estate perspective, leasing may be the only option available. Uh, if, if ground up development in the greenfield sites just don't exist. Again, uh, this, uh, this uh, sh slide attempts to just compare some of the uh, primary advantages that we typically see from leasing, uh, speed to market, reduced uh, upfront costs, and then uh, it, it does provide strategic flexibility. You're not locking yourself into a long-term capital investment. Cost of occupancy analysis, we encourage our clients to make sure that they're really applying the right uh, budget templates to their project. Uh, if, if, you're in, if, if you're in the beginning portion of an ambulatory initiative, uh, very frequently you're accustomed to high occupancy pricing on the, you know, uh, similar to what your acute uh, any of the ambulatory facilities require. Term length, uh, we very frequently see clients attempting or feeling the need that they have to enter into long-term leases up to 20, 25 years, and, and that's not always appropriate. It, it, it hinders your strategic flexibility. Um, so just uh, don't always assume that longer terms are, are better. From a lease versus own uh, perspective, we do encourage uh, health systems to really understand what their weighted average cost of capital is, which is different than just a, a pure debt service comparison. Uh, so you need to you need to understand what uh, what the cost of your equity is if you're going to be owning a facility and making sure you're properly uh, calculating that into your cost comparisons. And I'll turn it back over to Becky, where she will walk us quickly through a, a case study of Aurora Healthcare in the in the state of Wisconsin, and, and talk about how Aurora used many of the, the techniques that we've mentioned here today. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, to allow for questions, etc. I'll go through the slides fairly rapidly, uh, and Ted can chime in accordingly. Um, First of all, one of the things that uh, we looked at was looking at a kit of parts. In other words, can physician practice setting be replicated, diagnostics, urgent care, physical therapy, dialysis? Can many of the components be uh, scalable and uh, replicated over and over again? Uh, Aurora Healthcare, just quickly for those of you not in the area, uh, is an integrated healthcare system, uh, 90 communities, um, 15 hospitals, 159 clinics, uh, and 15 plus employed physicians uh, from their website. As you can tell, it uh, covers most of, uh, actually all of the eastern side of Wisconsin. It is known for uh, its uh, excellent uh, integration and excellent quality. actually occurred over uh, several uh, years working with them. Uh, the neighborhood model, the community model, and a regional model, again, looking at the sizes of those structures and determining where they needed to be based on a good, strong ambulatory strategy. Um, 
So driving operational standardization was the key element that was utilized. It started with understanding the preferred uh, standard model and uh, looked at uh, a study of individual clinic practice components and then laid those out so that they could be replicated and were scalable over and over and over again. I couldn't say that too many times. Um, the pods could be modified. Uh, in this case, uh, this particular uh, two side-by-side uh, uh, Um, and then I'll go through several models here quickly uh, in terms of sizing. Uh, there were many prototypes. Uh, a uh, consisted of um, 9,300 square foot. You can see it's a pot and a half and included x-ray and lab. Uh, B was um, a larger scope area. It also included uh, x-ray, but also a place for walk-in or urgent. technology, ultrasound, et cetera, MRI uh, if needed, uh, uh, more exam rooms to help support that diagnostic services and some procedure rooms. Uh, D, again, scalable, uh, trying to show you through a set of um, pictures here how you can move from one size and move it up accordingly. So C and D scale up, and they actually scale to E, uh, which was a very large 225 uh, physician practice setting that included strong diagnostics, uh, physical therapy, and many other components, including dialysis. Um, wanted to just show you in a picture what branding of an exterior can do. For those of you who've been through the Wisconsin marketplace, um, Aurora is very well known for um, its uh, sites up along the coast and uh, are very familiar based on the way uh, the drive-ups were done, the signage, et cetera, the brick, the color of the windows, everything like that. Uh, branding interior also used the same uh, components. Uh, sorry to say these are a little bit boring, but exam rooms were identical. Um, front uh, registration areas were identical, uh, use of colors, et cetera. It allowed for everything to last a very long time and still look very new. Patient satisfaction levels within the system are excellent, very high. And then uh, we also looked, as Ted indicated, uh, based on lease uh, space prototype. Uh, I'll, I'll forward quickly. This was a shoe store, and as you'll see, we were able to uh, put, a, put a different facade on it, uh, and then also on the interior, the, the prototype fit in um, uh, very nicely. So benefits of ambulatory prototypes, um, as uh, Ted indicated, he's much better at the numbers, lower cost facility model. from one side to the other, especially if patients are using the integrated model where they're moving from one primary care to maybe a specialist at another site. Uh, the lean approach to achieve efficiency and productivity exists. Um, there is uh, very much a I'll turn it back to Mark. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I want to uh, open it up for any questions that anyone might have at this point. Okay, I, uh, Roger, I don't know if you need to give the code. Um, it doesn't appear like we have any questions. Yes, I do need to give the code. And the code is 
Again, this is for New York, New Jersey, and Kansas attendees. 094N. That is 094N. Is Uh, uh, a, um, one question. Um, please discuss your experience in integrating uh, progressive primary care models. Uh, Becky, would you like to talk about that briefly? Progressive primary care models uh, in terms of integration, I think it the primary care and you're talking about family medicine versus internal medicine. Uh, I guess I need a little bit more information as to what they're looking for. I believe the, uh, the progressive primary care models such as patient-centered medical homes. Oh, okay. All right. make sure that the physician practice is on board, but that the sites also include the, the pharmacy um, component. And what I mean by that is the pharmacy availability, social worker availability, et cetera, so that when a family is brought in for a consultative uh, type um, uh, interview, they can see many of the participants as necessary at that time. Uh, again, I'd be happy to talk to the individual personally if we need to. That's kind of a broad overview. Okay. Mark, I see we have another question. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I apologize. I'm having trouble seeing these on my screen right now. Uh, can, you, can you read it to me, please? Sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the question comes, uh, what's, the singular, what is, what's the singular reason for ambulatory strategy execution failure? I would, I would say, and Becky, I'd be interested in your perspective on this as well, but what we've seen with our clients is that on, on the execution failure, it's 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 not changing and not standardizing your operating model. So um, integrating across uh, with physicians and not uh, not changing behaviors, not changing um, uh, operational models um, would be would be the biggest one. I, I and I actually I would I would add to that. Yeah, Mark. Mark, I would I would also agree to that. Uh, in uh, many times, as I said earlier, the acquisitions or mergers or changes occur, and no one's bringing the team along. So a, a new physician contract, be it one physician or 21 physicians, you know, are brought on board or or, or, or change some practice models change, but they don't change the practice itself. Now, that doesn't mean it has to 100% change. It means you have to integrate it. So the integration of that practice into whatever element it's going to be part of is key. And doing that early With that, if there are no more questions, um, we've, reached, um, we've reached the end of our scheduled time. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Um, and if you uh, have any questions,